Hey guys, welcome to a special episode of B-Sides. I am Pastor John, hanging out here with, of course, Pastor Rustin. How are you doing, Rustin? Doing great. How are you doing, John? I'm good. Are you ready for this special episode? Oh man, it's been keeping me up at night. <laughs> okay, well today, um, or usually in our B-Sides uh, episodes, we'll talk about sermons and and uh, kind of going through some of the behind the scenes details we can't get into. But today, we're not gonna be talking about a sermon. We are going to be doing Q&A from the God and government. Ooh, so much. And is some of this from the family meeting? It's from the family meeting as well, actually. Oh, I thought that, I thought that there was lots of, well, it couldn't, it couldn't be from the family meeting because it was all ATTW on the code. Oh, was it? So this is all God and government. Yeah, all God and government questions. All right, so this is Q&A from God and government. But before we get into it, there's a couple of things we got to take care of. The first is, if you're watching this and you enjoy it, take a moment to like it, comment, share. We appreciate it. And then the second thing we always got to do on B-Sides is what? What are you drinking today, John? All right, I threw you a curveball in our last episode with my little my little travel bottle of Gentleman Jack. But today, I gotta pour it here before I show you. I have something from Hardware Distillery, Ooh. which is in Hoodsport. And there's a guy there who makes, it's the only distilled mead in the oh, country. That is good. And the guy that he worked on this with was a guy from actually Lagavulin. Oh, be in Los Angeles, and he came up to Hoodsport, and so they figured this thing out. So is the, it is a distilled mead, so it's got a honey flavor with some raspberry, and it sounds really fruity. It, it is a little bit fruity, but it's uh, it's fantastic. If you haven't heard of Hardware Distillery in in uh, Hoodsport, you got to go check it out. It's awesome. You uh, shared that with me once, and I love that bottle. It's good. It's good stuff. It's definitely different. So the the. Uh, the whiskey, the bourbon I'm drinking today, uh, I chose because our subject has gotten government. And I'm, I'm drinking the Old Forester 1920 Prohibition style. Whoa. Prohibition style bourbon. What's that and mean? What's Prohibition style mean? Apparently it was a recipe made that they, you know, that they were using back in Prohibition time when you, it was illegal ah. to, to drink whiskey. Uh, until that, you know, they got fixed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this is the, it's, it's actually, it's quite good. It's, it's a pretty high proof. It's 115 proof. And wow. uh, it's very good. It, it, here's, here's a little description for you. In 1920, during Prohibition, Owsley Brown was granted a limited permit to bottle medicinal whiskey at Ooh. 17 West Main Street, Louisville Risk Whiskey Row. The typical barrel proof at that time prior to bottling was 115. So that's what it is, the 115 proof. Wow, it's 115. Yep, so it's 57.5. I feel like a, uh, like the water boy, like the backup quarterback, because mine is only 86 proof. This, this is good. This is one of my, I mean, I've been holding on to this one, so it just seemed fitting to have it for our, there's, a, there's very little left. I'm just going to finish it for our, conversation on god and government all right we're gonna need this right yep yep because there's cheers. How many, cheers how there's a lot of questions right there's a i think we got to like i don't know right. a, we got to maybe a quarter of the questions on our god and government night yeah i've got double-sided <laughs> oh lots of questions here so we're not gonna get we're not gonna go over every question because some of the questions were overlapping principles uh, you know, apply both ways and stuff. So, uh, but we'll try and get to the questions that were most representative uh, of the other questions or that were most unique and kind of got to the heart of stuff. So I'll be asking questions and then we'll both kind of interact with it. Okay, the first question, are you ready? Yeah. Can John go, actually go camp out on the lawn of that house? <laughs> I think that this was that that was a question in response to the uh the immigration question, right? Yeah, I was in Gig Harbor driving around or, or maybe it was, I think it was Bainbridge actually. Okay. And there was a sign about we believe or in this house yeah. there are no illegal and it was talking about immigration. They're basically saying borders and stuff aren't bad. And 
And so I told my kids, hey, I should come back with a tent and set it up in their front yard and see if they really believe that. So yeah. um, could I really go do that? I guess I, I could. I don't really want to. I'm not planning on doing it. I'm not going to do that. Okay. I, 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 think, I, think, I think because you brought that question up, I think it's good to just reaffirm some of the things we said in that, in that Q and A too on, on the night, but like, you know, the question, I think that was a question, that was a, res, a question brought up in response to a question about immigration and how should Christians think about immigration in light of the very, there's very strong biblical texts about caring and loving the immigrant because God's people were immigrants. Yeah. Absolutely. And, uh, and I think that a lot of times that rhetoric, um, or that biblical understanding is used to apply to scenarios that are, aren't necessarily directly applicable. Although there can be some, uh, there can be some truth there. So, for instance, I'd say just to reiterate what I said on on uh, during the class in the Q and A, um, Christians should absolutely love and care for the immigrant. I mean, the person who comes to your town, who is. Uh, who is a foreigner to your town or and it doesn't matter who it is like it could be also like your your understanding of immigrant needs to be shaped by uh not by what u.s politics says it is and yeah it's literally a, a, a anybody who comes to your town that is not is 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 new and and not of that town so you could even you can even say that people arriving from moving there that need to be welcomed could be considered under that under that now if you apply it to a country um i think that i do think that countries should have good immigrant policies i think that um for instance uh countries should offer asylum to places where people are under attack and i think that our country actually does a, a fairly good job of that um i think that the question was done in response to the the rhetoric around build the wall which is very you know has yeah. Been, yeah. And, I, and I do, I, I would say I do have some frustration with the way that that build the wall rhetoric is, is, is used. But at the same time, I have no problem with a, with a country saying we have a responsibility. The government has a, a, a civil government has a responsibility to protect its people. And that yeah. includes its people from outside threats. So the, the yeah. joke about, you know, can John go and camp on their property was, you know, households do this we don't let anybody into our house yes right? we're selective about even even the person you would invite in you're selective about because you have to consider are they is this someone a threat to my kids well we do let people into our houses we just don't yeah. let anybody who wants to come into our house exactly there's a difference there's a difference there and so and i think sometimes people when when people talk about immigration they assume that the united states doesn't let any immigrants into our country um, we let over a million immigrants into our country every single yeah. year. If you want a, you want a um, perspective on that, I think the population of Washington State is three million. Yeah, Does that sound right. Yeah, I'm uh, not right now. No, I don't think that's right. I mean, that might be the voting population. <laughs> the voting population is four million, but the actual population. Sorry. Okay, Washington State. Po sorry, that's seven point six million. Okay. So, so you're thinking like a seventh of our state is led into the country. I mean, that's a million people's no small mm -mm. number. So um, I think the, the debate is like, how do we do that in the, in, uh, in the most humane way yeah. with a legal process? Um, but I'm not gonna go camp out on somebody's. No, yeah. <laughs> okay, you ready for another question? Okay. Some of these are longer. Some I wasn't, these are that wasn't even like the real question. And we're already, I don't know how many minutes into this. I know. Okay. We got, so I'm going to try and like move us along. Okay. So we'll try and make these kind of bullet point answers if we can. Okay. Uh, what do you do when the governing authority is going against God's authority? Uh, I will, I mean, that's kind of an easy one. Any, any instance in, in which the governing authority is going against God's authority in a way that requires a response from you you disobey the governing authority and you obey god's authority but yeah. one of the one of the problems with that question is that uh governing authorities all the time go against god's authority yeah and a lot of times there's nothing you can you can do about it yeah um and depending especially on whatever polity you're under but um if so long as it affects you your conscience should be bound to the word of god yeah. if a government 
prohibits you from doing something God commands you to do, or government uh, commands you to do, to do something that you're prohibited to do, you should say, no, we obey God and not man. Yeah. There's a difference between a, a government permitting evil and a, and a government demanding evil. So when a government permits evil, you're, you're obviously, that's not a demand on you. You're not required to act in a way contrary to the word of God. But there's a distinction when a, when a government requires you to do something evil. So going back to the first century, you know, the, the, the issue for the church was, is Caesar Lord? Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and so the, the church, it, the problems with the church aren't because other people are saying Caesar is Lord. The problem with the church is because they're not saying exactly Caesar is Lord. And so you need to make that distinction between, I'm, am, I being, am I being required to do something or is something being permitted? And I can, uh, I can, I can think of some contemporary examples where, you know, a government, you know, can, Canada has basically said that you have to, you have to use certain pronouns when it comes to certain, you know, transgender people. You have to, you need to use a pronoun that's not consistent with what God says is true. Wow. Now, there's, does that mean you have to go around and like blatantly like try to r ruffle feathers and, 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 and adamantly go that way? You know, not necessarily, you know, but it doesn't, it does mean, I, I think that you, you need to really consider what does God's word say and live by that, not, not do something because the government's going to give you some punitive uh, fine or whatever. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. Uh, next one. Boy, I'm trying to, I'm trying to ease us into some of these. Um, what does good dominion look like and what does poor dominion look like? Okay. So I think this is in response to one of the things that I said in the very beginning was that God is Lord over all and yet God delegates authority. And as we see that in Genesis one, where God creates man in his image and he gives them dominion over the works of his hands. Um, good dominion is dominion that is consistent with God's rule as mm -hmm. it's not one that is, uh, you know, you think about a, a rebellious viceroy or a, a rebellious uh, steward, right? Um, yeah. Bad yeah. dominion look like the parable of Jesus where he talks about the, uh, the vineyard and the, the, the vineyard owner or the vineyard steward, right? And he leases the vineyard out and the, the vineyard owner comes to get fruit, comes to get his harvest and, and they kill his servant, right? There, yeah. that's, a, that's a whole parable about poor dominion. It's not, it's not bowing to his authority. Yeah. It's, it's not enacting laws and, um, and uh, justice in line with what God says, but with, with, with kind of stealing God's uh, world and creating it, trying to recreate it in its, in its own image. So um, good dominion would be as consistent with God and his character and his law as, as possible, I'd say. Yeah, I, would, I totally agree with that. Good, good dominion is going to acknowledge um, the, the reality of delegated authority yeah. So dominion doesn't see its authority as something that ultimately is given by God, that dominion will elevate itself to the place of God. Yeah. And then you have all sorts of problems. So yeah. acknowledgement as God is the ultimate authority and a, an embrace um, yeah. God's law, his, his rule, his righteousness. And that all leads to human flourishing. And I think that, and I think that just to add one more thing to that list, you said that um, because it's, you know, and you acknowledge it's a delegated authority. It's also a, it's a humble dominion. Yeah. Right? It's when yeah. it says, I, I don't make the, the rules. I don't, I don't define flourishing. God does. So I constantly diverting to what he has said and humbly walking in light of that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think of Jesus talking about the rulers who lorded it over them. Yes, and exactly. Poor dominion. Yeah, uh, and that lacks the humility that you're talking about. Yeah, and he's, I mean, Jesus came to, to serve. His dominion looks like serving, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> looks like a cross. Yes, it does, yeah. Okay, uh, next question. Just, just turn the other cheek, forbid the just war position, and Christians participating in military and government. That's really, okay, this is very, this is very funny, because I, um, I actually had a, a a youth student put 
a very similar question into at, at, at youth group and I answered this last Thursday. We because we, we have this question box where the students get to ask any all any and all questions are fair game and then we'll occasionally make them into a lesson. And so one of the questions was very similar to that, like how does being in the military square with um, you know, is that, you know, how does that square with uh, turn the other cheek, love your enemies and stuff like that. So um, I would, if, if the person asked this question after watching the, or participating in the class, I think that there's a lot of groundwork that gets covered, mm. I'd how I'd respond. Uh, if you haven't watched the class, I'd say go watch it, but because there's, there, there's fundamentally underneath that question is a um, distinction being made between personal uh, responsibility versus um, and ver versus an authorization that God gives to governments, civil governments, yeah. Yeah. in order to carry out certain uh, certain um, acts. And so, for instance, I, in the class we covered, you know, every individual is is given the responsibility and authorization to govern themselves under God's word. Right? We're yeah. supposed to, you know govern our hands and our feet and, and our eyes in a way that glorifies him and the standard is god's word and god and god is the one we bow to and then families god establishes an author authorized um authority there with, with parents over children and um and he, god does not authorize parents <laughs> to kill their kids if they if they commit a crime even right yep and uh, and God does not, God establishes the authority of the church, right? And he does not authorize them to put, do capital punishment. Uh, uh, and he establishes civil government. And it says in Romans 13, he gives them the power of the sword. That's the only, um, that's the only uh, government God establishes that he gives that authorization. And that's not contrary to, um, now that's different from uh, self-defense, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A husband is, should defend his family. And if that leads to something like uh, a, a violent uh, engagement with somebody that results in the taking of life, that's defended by Exodus 22. Yeah, absolutely. So if, a, if a thief breaks into your house and you end up, he ends up killing him, you're not guilty of that blood. You know, you're defending your family. That's a responsibility you have as a husband. Now, when Jesus says, turn the other cheek, that's very similar to when Paul says, uh, do not avenge yourselves, right? Yeah. Do not yeah. avenge yourselves. Um, and what that, in Romans 12, he says, you know, do not avenge yourselves. Um, and then in Romans 13, he says, God has established this, the civil government, the state, the, the, with, and the authorities with the sword to be his avenger yeah yeah right he says don't don't avenge yourselves but leave it leave it to the wrath of god is what he says in romans 12 and then he says funneled through the state which is funneled through the state he says yeah. he says he's given he, he's he's the state is god's servant for your good to yeah. avenge to be a terror to wrongdoers to avenge against evildoers with and to bear the wrath of god against them so similar when jesus says to his his followers turn the other cheek right He's not saying that Romans 13 is inconsistent with what he's saying. He's, he's not, not saying foreign policy. He's not saying foreign policy. He's not even saying that he's not even talking to a civil government. He's not telling the civil governor, hey, if someone is attacking you, you just need to let them attack you. Yeah. He's not saying that. That's like a total uh, miscarriage of exegesis to apply it to that situation <laughs> so let me, let me let me maybe paint a little picture here and see if this captures what you're saying yeah. let's say somebody um let's say uh somebody breaks a severe law against me right and they get prosecuted and they they get tried and they are found guilty i turning the cheek looks like me forgiving them but my forgiving them doesn't get them out of trouble with the state no so it's not an either or i am turning the other cheek and god is avenging through yeah. the state so if you so for instance if or i take it this way i use this example and i think you want to tell the youth but if 
if you witnessed somebody murdering your neighbor and you weren't able to actually intervene mm. because it was far away or something like that, or you kind of like put it together after the fact, right? Uh, or if it was your own family, like that, maybe that'd be more, more uh, congruent with a uh, turn the other cheek scenario, right? But I don't know, I'm not authorized to go find that person, hunt them down, and be judge, jury, and executioner of them. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. what the, what's the first thing I do? Call, call the police, them. right? Call the authorities. That's their, job. That's their job. So if somebody does something similar to me, right, and, that, and that it doesn't result in, you know, defending myself and some, a life being taken, but if somebody comes and, uh, you know, breaks my window or steals something, I can turn the other cheek and with and then call the police like with the other cheek I, yeah i'm not i'm not gonna go and to their house and break into their house yeah that would be the opposite of turning turning the cheek yeah, yeah right but i am gonna call the police and i'm gonna let that god work out his justice upon them through the means that he that he has established so similar when you talk so i think the question was specifically around just war is that what it was yeah so just war is part of the a yeah. large part of the question here so when it comes to military engagement, now, I don't want to in any way convey that militaries are somehow so great at not committing grave injustices, because they, they're, that's definitely not the case. So, um, turn the other cheek, yeah, it, that the governing authorities that have a military have a God-given responsibility to protect their people from evildoers, and that has in the past looked like defending themselves or defending neighbors using their, their magisterial powers and military powers. Now, and that would not, I do, I do not see that as contrary to turn the other cheek. Um, I uh, also do not in any way have some naive notion that um, govern, governments have always, have always been just in their uh, application of anything like just war. Yeah. I think that I also think that if you're in the military, um, just like, you know, every single one of these governments that I talked about, self, family, church, and civil government, all needs to answer to God. If you're in the civil government, the, 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 if you're in the military, it doesn't get you off the hook. You need, you still answer to God for what you do. So if you're, if your leader tells you to do something that you know is abjectly evil and wrong, you have a responsibility to say no. Like that's, that, if that had happened in Nazi Germany, it would have been a different, different story, right? Yeah, right, right. So there's a, there, everybody, everybody has to have their conscience bound to God and what he says is good, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's a check upon even, yeah. Even those other areas. So is that I think I think we answered the question. But in just war theory, just some of the things that have been um, that come up is one: is there a real evil that's being opposed? So governments can go to war over greed, over selfishness, over you know mm -hmm. power lust. So is there a is there a real objective evil that needs to be addressed? Um, is is it a legal war? Is it going through the processes? Um, is there um, of all the other um, yeah. Um, what's the word I'm thinking of? <laughs> all the other avenues been exhausted, yeah. all their options exhausted to try to avert diplomacy, uh, diplomacy, uh, et cetera. Yes. So you want to, those are some of the boxes that get checked in the just war yeah. um, theory. And then within that war, um, if you have a just war, that's not a license for every act that takes place in that just war to be oh. just because, yeah. you, you know, we've all heard stories of things that happen in war. And I am not envious of the Christian soldier who has to think through all of those, all those things. Yeah. Um, so, so just war and turn the other cheek are not mutually exclusive, but for somebody who's in the military, there are a lot of questions that have to be, yeah. Have to be navigated. Yeah. yeah. Just that, war is, is, is a, is a good way, a good place to start. Yeah. And I think that that's, uh, I was reading somewhere recently about how, you know, Christians, as the world advances and technology advances, Christians have to apply what they know to be true to new situations. Yeah. And just war is a product of 
a Christian understanding of, okay, the, you know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth was interjected into a world because sin existed, right? Yeah. But yeah. It, yeah. It, so injust, like sin leads to injustice and there's a curbing of that, of that injustice through, you know, punitive measures. And so there's a kind of application of that large scale within the, within just war, but it's a, it's a Christian invent, invention. It's a, a, attempting to take the principles and the, and the word and apply them in ways that, um, you know, you're, you, you should exhaust every avenue. You should, um, be as patient as possible. But at the end of the day, if, if, uh, you know, it should be, if there's evil going on that you need to respond to, right. Or defend your people from there's, there's a path to be taken the, the, that a sinful world requires. Yeah. That's good. Okay, this one's a, a COVID question. Oh, boy. <laughs> Here we go. Um, you arrived at a decision based on seeking the Lord, and then, a new man, and then a new mandate from Inslee changes your plan. Aren't you then placing Inslee's authority over God's? Uh, I, uh, so I I'm going to respond to this one. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah I'll butt in if I get a chance to. Yeah, you fill in whatever you, whatever you want. Um, part of me, I read this question, I go, I don't, know that the person who asked it quite heard what we were trying to say. So this was in response to us saying that every time we kind of come up with a plan with how we were going to be, you know, functioning as a church, it seemed like on that day or the next day, Inslee would have a press conference and he would change the rules and change the standards, in which case we would have, you know, lots of meetings as elders. And one of the things that we have said is that Inslee doesn't have a blank check to tell us how to function as the church. Um, the elders are determining how to function um, best. So this question assumes that every time Inslee talks, our plans change, which is not the case at all. When Inslee talks, we want to be mindful of what he says. We're not completely ignoring everything that he says. So we do want to think through um, the mandates. We are thinking through the guidelines, um, but we're not, plan we're not changing plans um, because of something that he says. So we're trying to be as thoughtful as we can. Um, and part of that is having the meetings and the discussions after Inslee does, you know, says something. Because as frustrating as it has been, we still want to honor authority. And we want to do um, what we can to honor him as governor. And also realizing that um, in many cases, this, the issue in Washington state is being handled as if um it's it's i say this all the time monolithic like what's happening in one county is the same thing that's happening in other counties and in our community thank god um COVID just hasn't been a big thing and so um so we have met we have we do pray um but we're not we're not submitting to Inslee every time he hands out a new guideline um but we do talk through it and i think if you're paying attention to the way that we've navigated this. Um, it'd be hard. You'd be hard to look at it and go, "We're we're following everything Inslee's asking us to do." I won't get into all the details behind that, but that's that's certainly the case. Yeah, I think that I think that at at base level, a response to that question needs to understand the two points that we have to work through every time Governor Inslee makes a new mandate. No matter what, every time he makes a mandate, we have a new situation to, to think through, right? Because we are on one side navigating what does it look like to honestly engage with and honor Governor Inslee, even though we disagree with him, which means we have to listen when he says something, even when if we, if we listen in order to say, that's not right, <laughs> right? right. We, and every new situation requires that. That's because that's what we're called to do. God calls us to do that. Um, and on the, on the flip side um, of that, you know, we're, we're responding to the virus itself in a way that we're, we're trying to be consistent with and submitting to the Lord through. Um, those are almost feel like two separate issues. And I think that, it, that depending on where you fall on how you engage with this whole discussion, people tend to fall like so heavily, they think that anything responding to the to the virus is just kowtowing and submitting to whatever the governor says right yeah. and then flip side it's like if you uh if you 
um, disagree with the governor and on, anything. on anything. It requires that you not do anything to protect yourself from the virus or to protect others or to be thoughtful. And I think that that's an unfortunate kind of pickle that a lot of pastors have found themselves in as they try to navigate this. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I think it's proper to acknowledge that it's something that everybody's wrestling with and that, but it's, I don't think, I think it's, it's, it's naive and I don't think it's um, proper to say that whatever Governor Inslee says, we should just like, just blow it. I mean, no matter how much we want to, it's just like, whatever. I mean, I, honestly, I feel that way sometimes. But, <laughs> right. uh, but, I think a lot of us do. But, but we have a responsibility to listen and respond. And yeah. that response doesn't need to be a response of subjection because we're not subjects yeah. to them. We're citizens. But it does require that we know it, we think through it, we, pr we pray again if he says something new, right? God knew, just because God, God knew that Governor Inslee was going to say something, God like, apparently wanted us to pray about it twice. <laughs> 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 you know, so I, yeah, I just, I, I think that the person asked the question, I, I would just say, you know, really consider, we're not saying that, you know, Romans 13 and, and Peter, 1 Peter 4 is all about doing what it, it is unlimited subject, submission to authority by no means, just kind of go down and see. But, um, but at the same time, you know, there is something required there that a new mandate does require us to pause and, and think through. Yeah, yeah, well put. Okay, here we are. Next one, if, <laughs> this, is a, this is a short answer, I think. If wives are co-regents with their husbands, who is co-regent with Christ? That's a really fun question because uh, it's a very intelligent question. I don't know who asked it, but I, whoever it is, feel free to come and talk to me because I think it's such a good question that I think we should have more conversations. But um, the church is co-regent with Christ. That's, that is, uh, now that doesn't, that doesn't mean what, people, you know, what, what some people might think it means, right? In terms of, you know, maybe this is a question that's coming up, so I won't get into it, but like, <laughs> It doesn't mean that the church is, uh, you know, you know, it's going to go down and start legislating where the stop sign needs to belong and who can park wherever. But like, but like, because again, go listen to God and government. You see, God gives out specific roles. Yeah. But yes, absolutely, the church is co-regent, and there's a reason. I mean, I can't remember where, where it is. Maybe you remember, John, but where Paul even says, "Don't you know you will you will judge over you will judge angels you will <laughs> you know, calls." Um, yeah, so meek will inherit the earth, yes. Okay, how much or how little loyalty should consistent Christians have to the Constitution? How much or how little loyalty should Christians have to the Constitution? Well, it's an interesting question because if our Constitution was it's interesting that the reason why it's interesting is that our constitution is not the word of god obviously so our, our 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 loyalty would be to god and his word above all else but our god and his word tells us to submit to the authorities and in our in our particular context the authorities includes a very um awesome constitution right that was crafted in such a way to give the freedom uh, necessary for the other governments that God establishes the free, free, free reign to do what God made them to do. Uh, he gave, he calls every person to rule over themselves, right? Mm -hmm. he, he establishes a kind of freedom as it were, but freedom under him, not autonomy, not autonomy, a freedom right. that is, is, needs to be in submission to him. Uh, families, right? In a communist country, Com the, the communism, uh, the state believes they own the children. They are, they are, the children belong to the state. That is a completely uh, diametrically opposed to how God says to the family. And it's evil. It's just, yeah. it's wrong. Um, uh, in, in communist countries also, they've been infamous for outlawing the church, right? Like Russia and 
in China, where everything is under the totalitarian regime of, of the state. That's also contrary to how God has set up things. And it's, you know, church history, first century to 300, the church was because it refused to fall under the, the lordship of Caesar, because it, it proclaimed that Christ is Lord, and yeah. it was an illegal religion because of that, and it was made illegal, was because of that an independent institution. It was the first independent institution in the Roman government that constantly was fighting against it, and it was illegal, right? So there's yeah. all the heritage of, of, the, um, of the church there. So um, the constitution allows for that. We should thank God for it. Um, loyalty to it, I mean, the constitution does get amended that doesn't, that, that doesn't mean, that, I mean, any loyalty to it in that regard would be limited. But at the same time, it's, it's kind of like, it's an interesting question because should Christians be loyal to something that, allow, that, that is, allows them to, um, in all their live, lives, have the freedom to fulfill the roles God has given them? I think that that's worth defending. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A lot of it depends on what they mean by loyalty. Yeah. Because loyalty it, can, can veer into idolatry. Absolutely. And I think that, and I think that if that's the question, where the question's coming from, I think that, that there should be a not, a, not a trust in or a hope in, or a, like the constitution, we, be, we should be thankful for, for it. We should um, know where it came from in terms of what the ideas were behind it, we should appreciate it. But yeah, if if the constitution somehow was to get a, a, you know erased or thrown out in the coming decade, should we feel like God has abandoned us? No. <laughs> yeah. you know? So by the way, I'm just gonna pimp this book out. This is a great book on uh, the founding of America uh, in terms of where the, where the, where the uh, constitutional stuff came from. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Next question. Here we go. This is a softball. Ready? Would Christians have been justified in using force to end death camps? If so, what about using force to end Planned Parenthood? Are we hypocrites or cowards? Oh, I like, like the options oh, in there. I like the options there. The are options. You or are you a coward? Hmm. Which one do I feel like most today? Um, so this is a, this is a very interesting question. And it's a and it's a com, it's a complex question, and I and I think that there's a spirit behind the question that is good. Absolutely. And there's an application, kind of embedded in the question that is concerning. Yeah. the The spirit of the assumption is, abortion is an objective, yeah. evil, atrocious, yes, disgusting, horrific. Yeah. If you, if, if you, yeah, if you feel like um, it's not worth being as passionate as about than slavery, then what world are you living in, right? Like, what, what's your authority? Is it like, where do you understand, how, where do you understand the value of human life comes from? Um, so here's, I, 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 I'm gonna, I don't think that there's a really clear cut answer to this in a way that is gonna really um, satisfy everybody. But let me give you my kind of like way I've thought through this, okay? So, um, God establishes the civil government with the mean, with, with, the, with the authorization to punish evildoers, right? Yep. So our, our MO in all kinds of in, injustices that we believe require punitive coercive action should primarily be oriented towards petitioning or getting our, our civil government to do something about it. Okay. That's like a principle that Christians should be able to easily understand as our first prior, our first course of action. So that's why Christians vote should vote in a certain way in order to in order to end the scourge of abortion, right? Mm -hmm. right. Um, it's, it's the reason why Christians should advocate for um, 
all kinds of different means to uh, expose the darkness of abortion, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and speaking of, of, of death camps and whatnot, so um, there's, a, there's a similar conversation I got with somebody and it's kind of related and I, I think it applies. And it's, so if you were, if you were, if you had, uh, were being invaded by tyrants or tyrants were taking over and, you know, causing all, wreaking all kinds of havoc, would it be unchristian for you to go and, you know, lead a battalion of like uh, a million guys, right? To go and fight off the tyrant. Uh, and my first response was, okay, if you have a million guys, what are you, what are you doing in the meantime, <laughs> going in or going and assassinating uh, somebody, for instance, is just lazy, right? Because it's not mm -hmm. actually dealing with the problem. Someone else is just going to replace that person, right? Yeah. In a lot of instances. So it, my, my first thing would be, you know, one, advocate for your civil government. Two, if you, if, if, you know, build culture that's Christ honoring wherever you are, right? And, and disciple the nations, disciple your neighbors, so that you, you are, and this is a long-term, not lazy move, right? Because it's, it takes time and effort, but so that you, you are in, in a situation where you can have more advocacy through the state to end these things. So for instance, you know, if we wanted to end, were there uprisings against death camps uh, violent uprisings against death camps. I'm sure that there were. Probably. Right? So were they effective? I don't, I don't think so. And so what was effective was actually having us another, another civil government come in and fight, right? Yeah. And it's also the, using the means that God puts in place. So um, yeah. in the, in the case of abortion, I, you know, there's, there's a bunch of people that are doing really good work here in terms of trying to get beyond just the vote vote <laughs> for the sake of this of the uh you know the uh the judiciary branch like that's kind of like every a lot of people know that you know you can voting for presidents that choose supreme court justices is kind of a hope for ending abortion but um it all that only goes so far right there's there's a whole nother area to consider and that would be um people like jeff durbin at a who does like end abortion now, for instance, he actually goes and talks to civil magistrates, right? And he says, you know, in the name of Christ, end this evil, right? And those guys actually have authority to do something. Yeah. And they can actually, you know, stand against these things. And that's actually, there's a, there's a book, uh, this book right here, uh, The Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates, okay? Who's that by? Matthew Truhella, okay, and it's a proper resistance to tyranny, and he he goes through like I mean Christ, This is another thing. It's really sad. Christians have a a very deep, rich um, tradition of this kind of stuff, and we've just forgotten it. <laughs> we've just forgotten it. And so he he talks about a lot of that in this book, and there's other books that you could get into as well. I think that. Uh, Glenn Sunshine just put a book out called Slaying Leviathan that just, that just talks about, actually, one second, here it is. I have it right here, this one, okay? Glenn Sunshine, Sunshine he's great. He's just super, and this is a history of resistance in the Christian tradition. And, um, he has a PhD, correct? What's that? He has a PhD, right? Oh yeah, yeah, he has a PhD, yeah. And an epic, and an epic beard. He has an epic beard, yes. And you so, know? But but read some of if you read some of those guys you'll see that not only biblically but historically Christians have played the long game in working with their governments their local governments to to respond to these kinds of evils right yeah and that makes sense in light of that's the one that God gives the sword to right yeah so yeah, yeah. and this is one of the things where I think that. Christians who want to just play off like Christianity is apolitical are, are, are giving up their entire, entire tradition of how they've, how they've seen how the church works with the, the political players rather than ap apolitical or just pretends like 
either side doesn't matter. <laughs> so, yeah, right. So, um, but I would, I'd encourage those two books. This one's really short and you could read it like in a day and it's like afterwards you'd be like, oh my gosh, n why has nobody ever talked about this? But if you, if, if you work through a civil, uh, a, a civil government and you, you know, and you influenced a, a small, what he calls a lesser magistrate, they have a kind of clout and power that you, whatever you do will never individually will, will be lasting and actually may in some way, ways cause, cause the opposite, right? So anyways. Okay. This one's about church government. How does, uh, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll answer this one. How does our church government work? It seems the elders have absolute control and congregation has nothing. So, do you feel like you have control, Rustin? Over, <laughs> over what? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Everything, cool. everything that I, I mean, everything that I do, you know, like, it's funny because like that question it, it, it assumes a, uh, like, what are we talking about? Like, I don't have control over, you know, where the lines get painted in the parking lot. I don't have control over, you know, like, are, is this someone who really wants to change the paint color in the sanctuary? I, I don't know. Um, so I don't some, even... <laughs> something that I think oh, that, that come to mind is that our, our church is governed, you know, essentially we have a Presbyterian model, like a local, we don't have the Presbyterian as far as the, you know, collection of local churches, but we are an elder governed plural, plurality of male eldership. Yeah. And, and that is not necessarily the norm for churches in the Northwest or the norm for churches in the U S a lot of people come from a congregationally run church and in a congregationally run church, you may have a senior pastor and you have staff and you may have um, elders that kind of function as like a, an advisory board. Um, but issues get brought before the church body and then, then the members basically vote on everything. It's kind of like a democracy. Yeah. So if you're coming from that background where members vote on, everything and then you step into quorum or if you went to any presbyterian um church it, it can feel like a little bit of a culture shock because we're not voting on things the the elders are making um a lot of the decisions now um what i would say and you can speak into this Rustin, is that um the the model that we see in scripture is that Christ is the chief shepherd, 1 Peter 5. They're under him, are under shepherds that are overseers of the flock that are accountable to God uh, for the care and the souls of the church. God entrusts to the elders, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3, the, the setting of doctrine and teaching. Um, the elders are entrusted to issues like church discipline. Um, the elders uh, ultimately are the ones who are affirming um, vision and overall direction for the church. Yeah, um, or those decisions are, are at, at the end of the day, are made um, by the elders. Mm -hmm. um, those decisions, however, are not made in a vacuum. Yeah, no, yeah. So, um, so for example, we have a financial, a financial committee um, that basically looks at finances and comes up with a budget and the elders get to speak in in terms of like um value and vision and and things we want to emphasize um but that committee really is doing a lot of the legwork and typically what they come up with the elders affirm and go that's good um when it comes to you know making church decisions there are people so, like so during this whole COVID thing we've consulted members in our church to go hey you guys have wisdom and knowledge that we don't you know, tell us what we can't see, let us learn from you, um, and then we're going to do our best to make decisions um, for that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's different from a congregationally run model just because everybody's not voting on it. The, the, the challenge with voting is, is you don't see voting in the New Testament at all. You yeah. do see um, elders, Paul speaking to the elders, uh, appointing elders over the church. Elders are clearly given the final uh, responsibility in handing church uh, matters. And so we're trying to 
Um, they're the ones that are actually also held responsible. Right. The elders are held accountable, which is, which is one of the reasons it's really important that elders have the freedom to make decisions because we're the ones that have to answer, you know, for those decisions. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that, you know, as far as like day to day details and whatnot that are really um, going to be driven by staff. So when we have our staff meetings, we have, you know, six of us are there on paid staff and we have, uh, pastors you you know you and i are both there brandon's there ryan's there uh krista who runs our kids is there Nettie, who does hospitality and everything else they're there and they speak into um a lot of the stuff that we're doing in terms of day-to-day week-to-week month um yeah. month, month. and um so i i i, I want to know like specifically what does absolute control mean i was like i don't <clears throat> i don't think we have absolute control um, but we do have a, a measure of kind of final say and authority uh, in the church. And one of the things we've tried to do is be really transparent. Like our family meetings are a time where we're trying to talk with the yeah. church body about what's going on. Um, we do Q and A, like, so, you know, stuff like this where we want people to ask questions because we want to make sure that people know, um, know what is happening and understand yeah. why, you know, we're making decisions and people know that we're not beyond you know, approaching or asking questions by any means, you know, we're, we're fallible and are, are doing our best to learn and lead. Yeah. Uh, and and we, so welcome, we welcome, we uh, welcome, we welcome that kind of like uh, insight from the, from the body. Absolutely. Yeah. And one of the, one of the, the ways that we try and, you know, I guess you could say balance that is when, like when you became an elder, Rustin, we, we brought you in front of the church body and like, if any of you, have any problems with rust and let us yeah. know concerns. I know. And after, they, after all those 12 calls, you know, 12, this is, this is probably where the question came from. You know, everybody called about my elder candidacy and yeah. no, no change was made. It's just, just kidding. What are you guys doing? Yeah. So, so we give um, a pretty thorough process, a screening process of that, and then invite the body to speak into that and, and, and communicate questions or issues or concerns that they have. Um, and if those can't be, you know, addressed or answered in a satisfactory way, we would, we would at least pause that elder process. Now we haven't had, we haven't run into that because usually when somebody is at the point where we're presenting before the body, we have a really good idea of who they are. Yeah. Um, and our body has been really supportive uh, of all the elders that have been, have been put forth. But, yeah. um, if you're coming from a congregational model, it is going to feel different because we don't, we don't vote. Um, but we do try and, and take into account input. We do try to be transparent. Um, we do try to glean wisdom and, uh, you know, uh, knowledge from members and the church body. Um, but at the end of the day, the elders do make, do make the ultimate decisions. Yeah. Does that, does that scratch the itch for you? Does that make sense? I think that makes sense. You could say it this way: the, the congregation has a voice, but not a vote. Yeah, I think that that's I think that that's fair. I mean, it's, I mean, it's not that that's not that different from just polity that we're used to elsewhere, too. I mean, it's there's, but it's not. I, I, we're we are not represent re- representatives, as it were, right? We don't we don't have yes. parts in the church that we represent all the elders are called to represent Christ to the church in how it leads, which means we should leave as, at least servants, which want to hear and, and, ha- and hear the voices, but it's not the same thing as like having a representative government. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right. I think we're going to close it off with one question. Okay. I think uh, we, we get, do we get through half of the questions or not even half? No, I, well, I think we got through the kind of the heart of, of all okay. if it wasn't specifically asked i think it was covered so this is uh we'll try to make this short i think i think there's a piper article behind this oh, okay is god's command forbidding murder of higher priority than standing or voting in alignment with his hatred of the proud so what i what i hear in this question which it might not be there but i i would be surprised if it's not there is this this notion that if you're a christian um, you have to vote with the right because the left is pro-abortion, but how can you vote for the right when the candidate on the right 
you know, President Donald Trump is clearly so in love with himself <laughs> and, 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 uh, and really has a pride issue. How, yeah. how, do you, how do you navigate those two things? Yeah. So I, uh, one, you don't navigate them by affirming President Trump's arrogance. <laughs> like that, yeah. you don't need to do that. No one. There's no, there's no. Just whoever is, who's watching this, there's no question that you and I both think he is exceptionally prideful, and he should repent. And he should repent. Let's just like, let's do that. So, um, probably means coming to faith in Christ first. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. He should repent and come to Christ and be, and humble himself under the mighty hand of God. Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm going to answer this question as though it's just straight up uh, about the Piper article. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> the Piper article, um, Piper put an article out, I don't know, was it a week before election day, where he basically, first off, it was super unclear exactly what he was trying to say and do. Um, later, he, like, I think eight hours later, the same day he, it was originally posted, he said, here's my article about why I'm not voting for Trump or Biden, okay? So that's, that's, he cleared it up later, but in the very beginning, mm -hmm. uh, he basically wrote an entire article to say what's true, which is that arrogance is, is deadly in terms of, uh, being an offensible and rebellious sin against a holy God and de deserves death and whatnot. Like that's all accurate and true. And yes, sure. Arrogance in higher levels of authority can have effects upon people. Sure. Okay. Awesome. But he basically used that, that um, argument in order to say that that's equal with <laughs> the moral equivalency with the policies of the left that are uh, literally promoting uh, full-term abortions, you know, zero restrictions, zero restrictions. literally promoting the, um, the non-discrimination against, uh, you know, an eight-year-old who wants to have their genitals mutilated because they, there's this trendy thing happening, you know, yeah called transgenderism you know there's and those those issues are those issues are complex but uh the is trump's arrogancy or arrogance i think arrogancy is a word um is trump's arrogance on the same level of policies that promote and allow murder and etc right uh in terms of response, no, they are not, okay? Like, you realize that God in his word gives punitive uh, responses to certain things, but not others. Yeah, yeah. You ever, is there anywhere? Some sins are crimes. Yes. Some sins are, some sins are crimes, and yep. then under that category, crimes are punished differently, and some, yeah. some crimes have the most severe punishment. And they have public punishment, right? Because they have public ramifications. Yeah. A murderer is punished with the with capital punishment in the Old Testament. That's what that's what's dole and that's what God gives to dole out to them. Because the murderer's actions have direct, irrevocable terror upon a people. Yeah. So yeah. there's a response in public to that action. Um, to 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 quali to um, put both of those things on the same level is to completely uh, eject and ignore all of the wisdom God's trying to give His people about yeah. what what the common good looks like. Yeah. Is to is to take God's word and drop kick it. And yeah, say, yeah, yeah. I agree that sins are all equal, but everything, all those details about about what's <laughs> what leads to the good of a people and not God, I don't want to listen to you. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. when so so my my big 
my frustration with Piper's article was it it really seemed like and he and he's gone and I think that somebody he emailed somebody and said I was not trying to make an equivalency it's like your ent his entire article was building an equ equivalency it, it doesn't make any sense if he's not to say he says at the very end I'm not going to do the calculus to determine which one of those is worse uh, but the whole point leading up to that point is that these are these are equal. both equal deadly yeah. equally deadly if not it almost makes it sound like it's, it's, the arrogance is more deadly. So, yeah, yeah, and I think there's um, there's the the question or the assumption in the question is both, I think, irrational and and a little dishonest. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I know that's I'm pushing something there, but the, let's the, just the, both say we love Piper. He's been yes, yes, yeah, well, for Piper, but well, what, that's what, why it was so frustrating to read. Yeah. Yeah. Because I remember his sermon where he called out President Barack Obama on abortion, and he was so forceful and, and clear about that. But this question right here, um, it, it's almost assuming as if somebody com can commit murder without that being a prideful act, like pride or murder. Well, murder takes pride to the next level, right? It's murder is not absent of pride. It is one of the most proud things you can do is to say that you are God who gets to determine the day set before another person. But there's also, I think, um, a, a certain amount of maybe it's maybe it's unconscious dishonesty, because if somebody wanted to say murder and, and lying or murder and pride are the same thing. And then you said you want a proud neighbor or a murderer neighbor. You say, oh, give me the proud neighbor. I was like, well, why? Because, you know. Is, are they both sins? Absolutely. Do they both do the same thing in a culture? No, they don't. No. Are they both destructive? Well, for sure they're both destructive. But to make an equivalency between those two, I, th I think it's, um, yeah. is atrocious. And the, the, way, the way that Piper said it, I couldn't help but walk away thinking, because I didn't actually know he was... I didn't know walking away from the article that he was saying that he was going to, that he, that he felt like both options were non-options. There, mm -hmm. There's no point that he's, he walk, that he tells you in the article that none of the options are, are, are like, don't do, he doesn't say don't do either of them. It's not clear. Right. Yeah. yeah. He walked away making you feel like both were equally bad. And because he walked away with you with, with, with this, making this case that both were equally bad. He also w walked away with this, making the case that they were equally viable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Party, in a two party system, you're, you, you don't have the option to have your, your third party win. Like, just be honest, like you're not. So you, you're, what you're saying is they're both equally unviable means that they're both equally viable options. Yeah. Yeah. So that I have a, I have a really hard problem with that. And I think that there's all kinds of like sub layer discussions we could have about the issue of abortion that we'll have to save for another time. But like, but that, I think that there's something uh, wrong about that. Um, and I think that uh, even the fact that when Piper has been questioned about certain um, things about his article he's been like no i wasn't trying to say that well if people are walking away thinking you said that then you weren't you weren't did not communicate effectively you weren't as clear as maybe you could have been yeah well i mean immediately after he posted that article i think that this uh this group this group against christian you know christians against trumpism or something like that took evangelicals for biden yeah no, no it wasn't even it wasn't pro-life evangelicals for Biden. it was it was a whole big group called Christians against Trumpism or something like that. And on their site, they had a list of organizations that they, th they thanked and individuals that they thanked for standing against Trump. Yeah. And he, they had John Piper's name on there and John Piper immediately came out and said, I did not endorse this organization. And then they, they responded and said, oh, but you, you are one of those who, you know, who has come out against him and we're thankful for you still. And like, like and by come out against them they meant like come out against as in saying don't elect this president right so yeah. uh, you know and so i don't think that obviously piper didn't want to be on that list because he doesn't agree with that so what does he agree with <laughs> it's just so i you know i love piper i think that 
I think that the way that he dealt with that particular issue was uh, confusing. And um, I think that I think that you can absolutely come out strong and make the case that Trump's arrogance is wrong. It needs to be repented of. Absolutely. I also think that you can make the case that uh, the, yeah, the personality that leads to the promoting the policies of the left yeah. Yeah. has to be arrogant because it's, it's saying that what God says absolutely doesn't matter. And then you have to ask yourself, um, <laughs> when I walked away, I thought, I said, well, the arrogance of Satan is the kind of arrogance that is smooth and clever, mm. right? It's not loud and, and abrasive, <laughs> you know, like the, the deceiver, right? Yeah. So it made me think, you know, you're not even thinking about arrogancy the, or the, po the, the possibility of arrogance taking different forms. So anyways, that's a fun question. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there'll be more of that in the future. Yep. Yeah. Sadly. Well, yep. Should we wrap it up? Yeah. Wrap it up. All right. Well, thanks for being with us for this special episode of B sides. And uh, if you want more clarification on a question or you have uh, an additional question that came up, please feel free to um, let us know. You can send an email to pastor at Corndale church. Make sure you put B sides in the subject. So we know you want us to address it. You want us to address it here, or you can just put a comment where this is posted and hopefully we'll see that. So Thanks for being with us. Until next time. See you guys. Peace. Peace.